Hello, uh, you're very welcome to Ovale's 13th, a virtual event. It is Ovale's 656th event, and you're very welcome from wherever in the world you are joining us this evening, or uh, this morning, or this afternoon, as it may be where you are. Um, the event will run in the following order. First up, we have uh, the five word challenge which is a writing challenge where you, the attendees, will uh, give five words in the chat box here. And the first five suitable words will be chosen and you're invited to write a poem or a flash fiction or a piece of writing using the five words. And you have 15 minutes to do this. And when the 15 minutes is up, you will be invited to read uh, your poem if you so wish. And there is a prize at the, the end of that. Whoever gets the most votes will win a drink of their, your choice from your own fridge. And you will get two books also. <laughs> and following that, we will be joined by two guest readers who we're very delighted to have joined us this evening. And that is Sandra Yunan and Lawrence McKeown. And they will read for us this evening. And after that, there will be an open mic. And uh, if you're invited to put your name in and you can perform and read uh, your writing for us. Um, but that will all come later. Uh, first up is the five words, uh, the five word challenge. As I ran through just there, um, I'll just run through it very quickly again. Oh, I don't think I need to. There, there are loads of words in the chat box. Oh. Um, Perfect. So let's see here. We have one, two, three, four, five. Great. I think uh, that's five words. So the five words that we will use this evening are goddess from Catherine Ronan, sanity from Augustina, cynical from Cedric, birthday from Lauren, and woman from Rosalind. That five. Four, five, yes. I uh, I do love the words magic and freedom from Karen and Pam, but I'll have to go with the first five words. So that's goddess, sanity, cynical, birthday, woman. And you now have fifty minutes to uh, write uh, something, a poem, fiction, uh, whatever you so wish. And after the fifteen minutes is up, uh, you'll be invited to read it if you would like and we would love to hear it. So thank you very much, and we'll see you in 15 minutes. <laughs>
now. So I think the 15 minutes are up there. Um, so I hope you all got on well writing. Um, so what's going to happen now is if you would like to read uh, whatever it is you just wrote using the five words suggested, uh, if you could put five words plus your name into the chat box here, and uh, that's five words plus your name and then we'll hear uh, what everybody has wrote and after that uh, for voting for whoever wins is if there's someone that you really like if you could take note of it or a piece of writing that you really like and at the end when everybody has read uh, we'll put the winner and the name the person that you'd like to vote for into the chat box but you can keep that until everybody's finished reading uh, so just take note of that yourself and we'll also be including Facebook viewers votes as well so keep in mind that there's uh, more people appreciating your work uh, great so the first person here in the chat box is Colm Scully so Colm would you like to take it away Hi, can you hear me? So, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. There are four goddesses in my house on International Women's Day. It would be cynical of me to pretend I'd forgotten. It's like all their birthdays crammed into one, parading around, shouting orders at me, insisting I do anything and everything. It's all I can do to keep my sanity, kowtowing to their every whim. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, and happy International Women's Day to everybody uh, watching here. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, great stuff. So the next person is Damien Donnelly, please. Hi, thank you very much and happy International Women's Day to you all. It's a joy to be here. Um, this is for three very important women in my life. My sister has two birthdays born from one woman to give to another. Separated by religion and the cynical snarl of a nun that mother cannot forget. My mother gave her up before she just met my father and discovered his infertility. I came later, restoring a semblance of a sanity for a while until my father found that same snarl. My real mother is a goddess, of course. Identity is easy to construct when you haven't got a clue and only one birthday. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, next up, we have Martina McGowan, please. Oh, and thank you. How could we not be cynical about a god, not goddess, who created a man before a woman, running around in birthday suits who would succumb to lust first? When the god, not goddess, shared secrets, he shared them with the man, who could only remember a portion of the message because it was too long and he was very busy. The god, not goddess, did not share the secrets of paradise with the woman. The clever talking serpent took the opening and spoke to the woman about freedom about the future, temptation, and outside, about life and death. The garden, if it existed, was not destroyed by a woman nor by the serpent, but by secrets and misinformation. There were people outside of Eden. So facing down the fiery angels, the woman and her children turned their backs on a paradise that was never meant to last and a life never intended to be earthly eternal. Thank you, Martina. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, next up, we have Lauren O'Donovan, please. Thank you. This is a little bit strange, but uh, let's go anyway. Happy fucking birthday to the woman I once prayed to as my goddess before you made me just plain pray. At first, it was all foreplay until I wouldn't obey, and then it quickly turned foul play. Today, I'm a lot more cynical than I was on our wedding day, otherwise known as Doomsday, a day I run away from mentally every day. 
my therapist told me, write this for my sanity so someday I would be okay with my sudden status change from fiancé to divorcee. It's so painfully cliché for you to have betrayed me, not with just a groomsman, not with just a bridesman, bridesmaid, but a married groomsman and bridesmaid with whom you now live in a polyamorous disarray. They led you astray, so you say, but I'm now wise to your toxic resume. If you ever try to parlay again, convince me there's no black and white, only grey. I'm going to take your beloved dog, who for some reason stays with me, and go far, far away, far from under your black magic sway. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks for sharing. Uh, next up, we have Anne MacDonald. Hi. Uh, great to be here. Hi, Sandy. Looking forward to hearing you later. Um, they said I lost my sanity when I declared myself a goddess, and I thought I should be no less, given that it was my birthday, and a woman should be free not to feel cynical and declare herself 33 and a third years old if she chose. I rose that birthday morning feeling positively festive, having rested for the previous six weeks when I declared that I had vertigo. No one can know if I have it or not, so I lay on my bed and chose instead to invent my goddess name. My claim to fame would be that I could see around corners and foretell what was well and what was off, and I could laugh and wear a scarf of discarded nylons no longer needed to cover legs, now, feel, now free to feel the breeze and the type of salt on my skin. No razors needed. If there was a goddess pageant, I would win for my excellent Irish dancing on eggshells, a skill I picked up as a child with a wild imagination and a taste for honey straight from the jar. I told my kin that birthday morning I didn't want their money, but their absence of opinion would suffice. And it would be nice if going forward they were genuflect when I pass by and call me Anula Ula Reels, goddess of the truth seeker, woman of the field. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, next up, we have Karen Warinsky. Okay, let me say this. So. March 8th was a birthday for sanity. After such a long hibernal winter, the woman's only distractions, those cold COVID walks with various cynical friends. They spoke of other winters, other summers, their families, some dreams. Now it was edging towards spring and she felt something akin to hope, though not hope itself. As she combed her hair in the forgiving bathroom light, looked in the mirror and tried to see a goddess. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. Next up, we have Augustina Adeoy. Uh, sorry. Augustina. Adeoy. Augustina. That's okay. <laughs> Can you hear me clearly? I don't know. I always have a robot sound going on. No, loud and clear. Brilliant. Mental foreplay as inner worlds build up with cynical ideations. Edging, climaxing and teasing the very end of my sanity. I grip the sheets woven with peace of mind tightly. My nails would almost snap off and leave nothing but cuticles, a bloody mess and plenty of pain and even that would be generous. As we approach the birthday of this shambles I find myself in, loss of my livelihood, social life and relations, questioning if I will ever be the same woman, begging the goddess within me to let go and release this anger, hoping that I will somehow manage to maintain freedom, filled with desperation and the need to believe in magic, I came. I washed my hands in the dark, murky water. It left traces like ink stained me. The sheets woven with peace of mind have markings all over. I am desperately trying to wash them and remove all traces, accepting any advice at this point because it's pretty clear I have forgotten how to bath or do any laundry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Augustina. 
And next up is Rosalind Blue. Right, thanks very much. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, Woman's Day. This celebration of woman from the day of birth to the days of wisdom and the nights of passing. This celebration of woman, appreciation of each goddess within, is the wakening of spring, the return of sanity after the dark of winter, an injection of magic with a cynical touch, an air of ignorance, the innocent not knowing that the strife for freedom will not be won until Mother Earth herself has the true respect of all. That's it. Thank you so much, Sue. And next up is Ada. Oh yeah, uh, the problem is I have a robot video, like Augustine, I was having robot Samsung. Oh, okay. Okay, this one is a bit angry because I'm having a horribly abusive day. I'm being abused emotionally again. So here goes. It's called O-N-N-A. Sanity sucks. Birthdays are shit. I'm a woman and a man. What goddess to help my ma? I know exactly. Am I cynical? This is it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Ada. Hopefully uh, you'll have a better evening. <laughs> Um, great stuff. Uh, next up is Cornelia, please. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, um, today on 8th March, Sanity was declared a goddess, a generous goddess, a magical goddess. Today, Goddess Sanity declared that this is not a time to be cynical. This, this is not a time to be petty. This is not a time to count only one's own little blessings. Today, Goddess Sanity blessed all creatures, blessed all wise witches, blessed each woman and all of them. Today, on 8th March, Goddess Sanity celebrated her birthday, declared a celebration of joy, blessed those who mourn the dead and who pledge that not, no one will have died in vain. Today, Goddess Sanity established that the wisdom of wise women will rise and will overcome pettiness, covetousness, cynicism, avarice, and isolation. Thank you so Thank much, you. Cornelia. Thanks. Um, next up for the five words is Brendan Mulcahy. Oh, I think you're on mute there, Brendan. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. I, I'm I'm going to I'm going to pass as well. Um, um, I'm I'm not happy with where I've got to with that little uh, bunch of words. But can I pay tribute to? I think the standard tonight is staggeringly good. Wonderful, wonderful poems, but not mine. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, great. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, no worries at all. Uh, so the next uh, five words participant will be Susanna. Thank you. Let me introduce you to my birthday woman, Anu, Sheila, the hag, the crone, the mother of mothers. Her breasts are the hills in Kerry, where I drove you last year. In the car, you told me I'm too opinionated and cynical. I replied, the criticism nurtures my sanity. You laughed. We did not hold hands at the feet of the goddess. Well, you quoted my relentless but justifiable complaints. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susanna. Uh, next up is Pam Campbell. Brendan, read yours. Listen to mine. I'm taking a chance. <laughs> okay, Needlewoman, goddess of stitch and beam support holding babies, lovers, strangers, in the small cynical curl of troubled space, tugging, tearing at your sanity, your breath, the light in the dark of day, you, O oh, carver of birthdays for others, 
stitch an underpinning of yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pam. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Brendan, you were dead right that uh, the standard of everybody tonight is really great. And uh, it's going to be tough to choose winners because uh, everybody's a winner, really. Uh, so next up in the five words is do, 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 Cornelia Mayak. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this has no title yet. I keep losing my sanity in all sorts of pockets, blue, silk, thorn or yellow. Still never in my jeans of pockets marketed for a woman, which pop everything out like a toaster. I would have found my sanity by now, if not for my reoccurring birthday. I keep realizing that I am living and I keep being asked to blow out candles instead of burning the cake for a change. I will never find my sanity as a goddess in a woman in a cynical world. I do not have good pockets to guard it, and the candles keep relighting. Thank you so much, Cornelia. Thanks for sharing. And next up is Carl Holden. Hey guys, how you doing? One second, let me um, get this one out. Cool. Um, the God of Sanity is mad as he is cynical. The mad God makes things fit. A church of flint and shirt. His fingers dance, transient lines forming along the spine of she, whose earth births day each morning. The goddess who may take all with no warning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cahill. Um, we also have another Cahill, Cahill uh, 1958 wrote a haiku, uh, but has no audio, so I'll share it with you. A uh, cynical woman may use sanity to scare magic from goddess. It's Cahill 1958 joining us as well. Uh, great. Uh, so next up in the five words is Catherine Ronan, please. Hi everyone on this day, great to be here. Uh, my poem, I call it, Paddy does not have his day or his way. You offer me a kiss and with your cynical tongue, roll me like a boiled sweet, found at the back of the cupboard. Mmm, sticky, but still flavoursome. It was my birthday and being Pisces, I decided to swim upstream to frustrate my sanity. You humbly Joel more than a woman to me. Sidle up and whisper in my ear. I am Saint Patrick, but you can call me Paddy. Everybody in Ireland just loves me. Everybody falls under my feet. They'll do anything I tell them. Well, Paddy, I was here before you. Run, Paddy, run. I am Cleana, ancient goddess of monster, queen of the banshees. You. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, cool. Uh, next up is Cedric, please. Okay. Uh, yeah, I had to uh, rewrite it almost entirely at the last second. <laughs> I hope that will work out. Today, I dare not speak of the unknown in fear of its divine nature. A woman or a goddess, I cannot say, for my words are more cynical than I mean them to. A heap of flesh and life, surely, and to me, a taste of human magic. Today, we celebrate that we exist together. A birthday of sorts where we elevate each other the way they raise us. Thank you so much, Cedric. Great. 
Uh, next up is Mags Creedon. I'm trying to rewrite it as well so I can read something. OK, I'll try it anyway. On this day, all hail to the warriors, the ladies, the gladiators, the suffragettes, the Amazon, the trailblazers, the enclosed, the cloisters, the cloistered who offered it all up, who drink their poison chalice sipped by sacrificial sup to the goddess Venus in her birthday shyness arising from her shell. Forever frozen alabaster, like a delicate pearl, the Botticellis, the Toulouse Lettrex, the glue staff clips, in brocades, in jewel colours, in mosaic cloaks, in light relief stucco, in gold leaf. To the social activist reformers, cynical of the suits, who maintain their sanity, who challenge complacency in a, with it, and sloth. Here's to the poor partum, the vessels of the seed, the silent in their waiting chamber, the vocal, tough when they're needed. All the mothers are amazing. Some struggle to say sane, to those with discipline, well, fair play, to those who fight their demons every single day, to stay, to battle in their painful corner, come what may. To Goddess Danu, to the deity of the Paps, the woman of Newgrange who summons the sun at equinox, to Bridget of the Bees and Saint Gobnet of the Albino Deer, to the domestic goddess on a budget, to himself when his self is heading out for his beer. Well done to all the women who have made me what I am, to my beautiful daughter. You're an example and an inspiration. To every Judge Judy and to Camilla and to Oprah, to every trafficked woman and every prisoner of conscience, all hail. That's it. Thank you so much, Meg. Um, great stuff. So next up is Philip. Phil? Goodness, no. Hi, sorry, uh, yes, late entry, I wasn't going to, but I've been shamed into it by listening to everyone else. Um, so here's my short offering. Who could be cynical about sanity or deny the right of a woman to be goddess? As it would be insane to be cynical about the rationale for an international or any other woman's day, and especially when it comes to my goddess woman's birthday. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so Thank much, you. Philip. Thanks for coming in. Uh, is there anybody else there having a last feelings about whether or not they'll share? Uh, it's last call now, I think. Brendan, will you? <laughs> not with those particular words. Next time. Uh, cool. So, uh, great. So I think that's everybody. Thank you so much to everybody who participated and those who read. Uh, it's, it was great to hear everybody's work. So now we'll choose a winner. Uh, the winner will win a, a great, they'll win a drink, uh, courtesy of their own fridge. And you will win two books. And that is uh, Lawrence McKeown's uh, book, Threads who Lawrence McKeown is one of our guest readers tonight and you will also win uh, the five words anthology uh, the eighth edition so two really nice prizes there for the winner and how the winner will be chosen is if everybody could now put the person's uh, winner put the word winner plus the name of the person whose uh, work spoke to the most or who you want to get those two nice prizes so uh, there'll be Tapping up the, the names now. Just give it a couple of minutes. And people watching on Facebook as well, you are invited to uh, participate as well, and your votes will be counted also. So, yeah, they're good words. It's, it's nearly everybody now will have had a pandemic birthday. So, hopefully, we all haven't become too cynical. Uh, whoa, there is loads of, loads of votes here. Let's get them added up. Paul, I might need uh, some assistance here. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, just give me about two minutes or so and I should Perfect. have a result for you. No worries. Feels like we're at a game show. It's tension. There should be some dramatic music. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Well, in the pub, we'd just be chatting and getting drinks. And <laughs> get out your drums, Sue. Get out your drum for dramatic. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. So now I can fill the gap. If people are interested in a workshop on surreal poetry, um, we will be holding one in Deborah's Spoken Word on Wednesday. Uh, Lauren and Catherine are involved in organising as well. So I'll put details up in the chat in a minute. Um, if anyone wants to leave their contact details for me, or if they want to um, look up the Facebook page, Deborah's Spoken Word, they can get all the information there but it's very unusual surreal poetry workshop and it's um Catherine could you say who's the or explain about Gideon because I don't know much about him yeah um um Matthew Gideon is um a, a very talented facilitator and I've done numerous workshops with him and um he's based in Kinsale and uh, he lectures in the MA creative writing course in UCC and um, he's just uh, he's just fantastic, and the surrealist uh, poetry is uh, really interesting and really fun to do. Great stuff! Thanks very much. So, uh, if you want to hear more about that, I think uh, Catherine or Margaret said that they'll they can you can contact them and, and they can have a chat about it. Uh, but for now, for the five words, the votes are in and have been counted and including the Facebook votes, uh, Mags is the winner. So you, yeah, Mags. And uh, thanks to everybody who read and Mags, you, you were invited to read yours oh, again. Thanks, because I thought the poems were great tonight. And uh, I salute all the other readers. Okay, if I can find my thing again. Thank you, everybody. On this day, all hail to the ladies, the warriors, the ladies. The gladiators, the suffragettes, the Amazons, the trailblazers. The enclosed, the cloistered, who offer it all up, who drink their poison chalice, sip by sacrificial soap. To the goddess Venus in her birthday shyness, arising from her shell, frozen forever alabaster, like a delicate pearl, and the Botticellis, the Toulouse Lutrex, the Gustav Klimt's in brocades, in jewel colours, in mosaic cloaks, in stucco light relief, in gold leaf. To the social activist reformers, cynical of the suits, who maintain their sanity, who challenge complacency uh, with ubiquitous loath. Here's to the poor partum, the vessels of the seed, the silent in their waiting chamber, the vocal, the tough when they need to be. I can find it here. The silent, sorry, all the mothers are amazing. Some struggle to stay sane. To those who, who have discipline, well, fair play. To those who fight their demons every single day. To stay to battle in their painful corner, come what may. To goddess Danu, to the deity of the paps, the woman of Newgrange, who summons the sun at equinox. To St. Gubnet of the St. Bridget of the Bees and St. Gubnet of the Albino Deer. To the domestic goddess on a budget while himself thinks off for a beer. Well done, all the women who made me what I am. To my beautiful daughter, you are an example and an inspiration. To Judge Judy, to Camilla, to Oprah, to every trafficked woman and every prisoner of conscience, all hail. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megs. And uh, you can send a private message to Paul with uh, your details and he'll get those books sent out to you. 
Uh, so thank you so much to everybody who contributed and read. It was wonderful to hear everybody's work, really beautiful, thought provoking stuff. So thank you so much. Um, so now we have uh, just a few housekeeping announcements. And then after that, I am delighted to introduce your guest readers for the evening. Um, so uh, in terms of announcements, the results of the eighth Five Words International Poetry Competition have now been announced. Congratulations to the winners and shortlisted poets who will be published in Ovale's annual publication, Five Words, Volume 9, I want to say. Uh, I think it's nine. Uh, sorry, I can't read Roman numerals. <laughs> One, four, uh, 14. Uh, 14, way off. Five words, volume 14. Thanks, Paul. Uh, launch next month at our April event. This is the final call for submissions of any five word poems written since April 2020 during the online Ovale events to be emailed to submissions at ovale.ie by the 10th of March. So if you want to submit any of the poems that you've written in the past year since April 2020, you can email to submissions at ovale.ie by the 10th of March. Uh, there is an audio archive um, of the blog of previous Ovale events and the link is in there in the chat box. Um, Ovale aims to maintain a safe space for writers and the general public attendees. So while the private chat mode is available for all participants to use during the event, we ask that you please be respectful when communicating via these channels and to report any online abuse immediately to Ovale, either through the private chat or you can email info at ovale.ie. Um, the open mic session will be available to revisit as an MP3 podcast and on video via vimeo.com slash Ovale. The reading itself is a once-off live event and will not be available to view afterwards. Uh, our 14th anniversary Ovale event on the 12th of April features competition winners Sinead McClure, Jill Munro and Laura Theus along with our other shortlisted poets and contributors to Five Words, Volume 14. The anniversary open mic is dedicated to other poets' poetry, so please bring along a favourite, uh, not just your own, so you can read your, your favourite poets uh, at the open mic. And thank you to everyone who has kindly offered donations. PayPal donations can be made via the link above the live poetry stage on our website, or via our contact page, which is, uh, the link is in the chat box here or in the chat box on Facebook also, I believe. Uh, great, so that's uh, all the announcements we have for the evening. We have two guest poets reading for you this evening and I'm delighted to introduce them. Um, I will introduce them separately. So the first person we have reading tonight is Sandra Yanon. And she, uh, sorry, Sandra Yunan uh, is with us this evening and I'll just introduce uh, him first before uh, the reading will begin. So Sandra Yunan grew up in Oldbrook, Connecticut, where she looked out daily for a view of Long Island Sound across the water at the end of her street. She published her debut collection, Boats for Women, in part about the Titanic disaster of 1912 with Salmon Poetry in 2019. Salmon will publish The Glass Studio in 2022. Sandra's poems and book reviews have appeared in numerous print and online journals, including Plowshares, Poetry Ireland Review, Prairie Schooner, Sweet Live Encounters, Women's Review of Books, Impossible Archetype, and Lambda Literary Review. She also has written a series of essays on the intersections between poetry and social justice for works in progress. She hosts Cultivating Voices Live Poetry on Facebook on Sundays, and you can visit her at www com. And I am absolutely delighted uh, to introduce Sandra for you this evening. So without further ado, please give a big welcome to Sandra Yunan. Thank you so much, Shauna, Paul, and to all of you in the extraordinary five word challenge. Um, I love the format so much and it was, it brought me back to the two times I've been able to join in person 
um, at the Long Valley, of course. Um, and I look forward to returning again. Um, I want to start out by saying happy International Women's Day to you all. And in honor of International Women's Day, I actually thought I would read a poem by a poet that I thought that I think exemplifies the day. Um, a poet whose last collection I always have by my side, which is Ivan Bolin from her book, The Historians. And I'm actually would like to read The Historians. I can't help but think I'd far I, I would far prefer, and I'm sure you would far prefer to hear this poem in her extraordinary voice. So forgive me. <laughs> uh, this is Evan Bowen's The Historians. Say the word history. I see your mother, mine, the light sober, the summer well over, an east wind dandling leaves, rain stirring at the curb. Their hands are full of words, one of them holds your father's journal with its note written on the day you were born. The other, my small rhymed scratchings, my fervent letters. Before the poem ends, they will have burned them all. Now say the word again, summon our island, a story that needed to be told the patriots still bleeding in the lithographs when we were born. Those who wrote that story labored to own it. But these are women we loved, record keepers with a different task, to stop memory becoming history, to stop words healing what should not be healed. It is cold, the light is going, they kneel now behind their greenhouses, beneath whichever tree is theirs. The leaves shift down. Each of them puts a match to the paper. Then they put their hands close to the flame. They feel the first bite of the wind. They lace their pages with fire. I finish writing. That is a woman who needs no adjectives, the extraordinary Van Bolin from her book published posthumously, The, the Historians. And um, a dear friend in Sligo sent that to me for Christmas. Uh, I really cherish it as I cherish like every poem she's written. Well, so now to my, um, <laughs> my poems that cannot live up to hers. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm going to read some poems from Boats for Women, um, and uh, here's the book cover by the extraordinary Siobhan Hudson at Salmon Poetry, thanks to um, my editor, who's also Paul's editor and also Lawrence's editor at Salmon, Jesse Landeni. Um, I like to share with people that my book, um, I wrote it, I finished it in 1998, and so it took 21 years to publication. Um, so I, I always like to share that with people because I, if you aspire to write a book, it may be a long time, but keep your dream alive. Um, the themes in it, um, as Shauna told, alluded to a little bit um, uh, because of the Titanic disaster, uh, the, the four words that I used to describe it are silence, disaster, desire, and hope. And there are four sections in the book and I'll read a couple poems um, uh, from the first section and give you a taste of each section and then a couple new poems. This is literally the first poem in the book uh, in, from the first section called Transatlantic. My hand lifts to ink this page the way I might slap the face I want to caress, a stiffness that mimics the earth's global warming spin. I spin, you spin. Oceans divide us into continents of wants. Two wooden doors marked women and men who decided 
that we had to choose which cells to hide behind and enter. So the second poem uh, is this first session, first section is pretty much all about maritime disasters. And I'm very grateful, of course, to um, my connection with Ireland through the Titanic disaster, but also um, the joy that the ship was was built in Belfast. And, and I know that there's a lot of issues with labor, um, but nevertheless, that, that ship created quite a story um, and quite some history. And I am grateful for, I'm grateful that we're able to connect through those stories. Um, I'm doing right now an erasure project of an entire book written about the Titanic called A Night to Remember, which was a book written in 1955, the first book that ever had accounts from survivors in it. Um, there were, at that time, there had not been, 1955, there had not been any books except just maybe one or two written about the Titanic. And now there are well over 10,000 books written about the Titanic. So this is um, that first very significant one. So this is an erasure poem. It's in, it's in Boats for Women, um, but the rest of the book will be its own collection. This poem is called, A Night to Remember Your Beautiful Gone. 14 April, 2017. And there were no more. Never again could the world fall apart, off duty, put to sea, outdated and absurd capacity. This worked out. This meant she had to carry nobody. Even so, this took care of only everybody. The end of class denied anything of investigators, evidence that hundreds were kept crawling from ladders to escape. They were so hard to find. The statistics suggest casualty, not to mention the chance to be better, but not perfect. Remembered at the gate, may we pass, they asked. No. In fairness, these distinctions set policy as if from no policy at all, barred the way, but didn't tell anyone. Left to shift, enterprising, no one seemed neither anything, just proud of covering arrival. The thing I like to say about Titanic, um, of course, I don't like to say it, but um, there are so many stories, depending on the cultural lens that you're seeing the story from. And for the longest time, you know, the American lens is very different than the Irish lens. And, um, and the American lens really likes to gloss over class, that, that it really elevates all those robber barons and, and make them shiny, magnificent people. And um, yet the stories that um, are very compelling to me were those distinctions uh, of the classes. And, um, and of course, uh, I've been to Cove where so many people emigrated from um, and where 123 people boarded um, uh, from Titanic's last port of call. Well, I'm gonna move to the second section. And um, uh, the second section of the book is a series of decade poems. I write a poem indicating um, every decade of my life, and um, this is uh, 2014. All those years behind tinted windows, on the go, a passport tucked in my back pocket, waiting for reprieve, a passionate traveling, always hurt, head against mine, unfinished prisons, flying fire, worthless, worthwhile dreams. I chose the former, that I was the way I could not stand. The world, now as belly, recovers a woman, a man, I must miracle and finally disrobe. Well, in the third section, 
of the book are a series of poems um, written in the voice of Bess Houdini, um, the partner of the famed Harry Houdini, the musician, uh, magician. He was, I do not know that he was a musician, magician. Um, and you can imagine my absolute joy. These poems were written prior to the Titanic poems, a series of Titanic poems I read. And I, um, you can imagine my joy when I realized, oh, Titanic and Houdini kind of were hanging around in the same swirl of history. So this is a poem that imagines that swirl with some true facts thrown in for good measure. I'll let you decide what's the truth and what's the fiction. This is called Bess Houdini Reveals Her Secret to the Modern World. His cruelest of all tricks, irreversible and no one knew before all sleights of hand, knots slipping, lock picks under tongues. I remember the taste of metal in my mouth as I bent to kiss him before each death-defying act. How once the pick punctured the wall of my cheek and I bled. Sometimes he got a little out of hand, like the night he performed the water can in Philadelphia during the January freeze. The Bergdahl Brewing Company filled his cell with eight gallons of lager. He escaped, intoxicated, all boast, betting the locals he could make the Titanic disappear. From his armchair, three months later, he read the evening headline to me in his confident drawl, all saved from Titanic after collision, his portrait smiling, handcuffed in tuxedo and leg irons propped next to him on the mahogany end table. The next day, I slipped out of the house, bought my own morning paper before he woke. The headlines still accused the iceberg, the grainy photographs of the lifeboats empty on White Star's piers 58 and 59. I stood on the street corner, I knew the full capacity of what he could take from this world and what he would not give back. So um, I'm going to uh, share now the final, um, the, the title poem to the book, Boats for Women, and then just read a couple um, newer poems for you. So this is the title poem, Boats for Women. Yes, the boat sank. Yes, it broke into like a stereotypical heart until 70 years later, technology caught up and looked its ancestors in the face. Yes is the way the years oxidize the steel and yes wipes the name Titanic off the bow. Yes are the lifeboats, the davits, the call for women and children first. Yes, are the men who cry from the decks. Sometimes when I kiss her, I am leaving a yes on her lips to let her know I will go down with this ship. Sometimes when she whispers yes, we are staying on board, but there is always room in the lifeboats for two more women. Yes is the fact that if we were alive on that night, we would have lived. Well, if you are a, thank you, if you are a salmon poet, you're a very fortunate poet indeed, because um, our intrepid editor encourages and sticks with you, and you're asked to produce another book quite a few years later. Uh, so this is the title poem to my upcoming collection. Uh, it'll probably be 22, but it might be 23 because of the pandemic, where you haven't quite negotiated that yet um i'm good no matter what i'm grateful um to um have this connection with um the incredible um literary community um in ireland as an american poet um it's it's really really stimulated me in the most positive ways um so this is the title poem to the new collection called 
the glass studio. I must go back to that photograph of me, 14, on an early morning in my father's makeshift sweatshop on the unfinished second floor of my grandparents' house, leaning over beige squares arranged in a plaster poured mold, my Red Sox cap cocked backwards like a trigger waiting for release, my left hand steadying the steaming soldering iron while my right pushes coiled snakes of lead into the iron's hot tip to melt them into quick silver seams, fusing those cut squares of glass into translucently beautiful panes if I hold them up to the light breaking through the second floor window. I sweat through this labor. I breathe in the noxious fumes. I wear no protective mask. My hot pink lungs slow burn towards death, hour, after hour, I run my hands over glass like this, iron and lead, like over the seams of women's bodies it will take years for me to touch. I use the same precision to bring them full circle to when they become translucent. My father teaches me all of this with squares of cut glass, not ever saying the word sex, without ever claiming to transfer the knowledge of how he broke into my mother's body to create something sacred akin to a family. Downstairs, my grandfather returns from hours emptying glasses filled with Kentucky bourbon and ice, brings home his daily ragings like newspaper headlines and smashes everything on the first floor to tiny bits. I sit up here on a metal stool in the glass studio, mute like a bird who has lost faith in song, soldering everything back into place. At the height of these humid summer afternoons, my father disappears after his initial instructions and before my grandfather returns. He teaches me how not to press the iron against glass squares in the mold for too long. He shows me how the iron-willed iron desires nothing beautiful in its intention to burn. So if left resting on the glass's skin, it will provoke an irrevocable wound. After hours inside of this sweat and burn, heat from the tip of the iron threatening to welt my skin with each beaded line, the fumes filling my lungs like my grandfather's cigarette smoke overtakes the living room where my grandparents sit ruined downstairs. I close up the studio, pressing the sashes down hard and drawing the curtains closed like stitches, turn off my iron, clean the tip in toxic flux until it smokes, whip down the staircase where on the other side of the wall, my grandparents smolder in today's aftermath of broken glass. I pull the door tight to keep them inside, turn the brass doorknob hot in my palm, run next door up the stairs to my bedroom and strip my skin, now a mix of sweat from lead and labor and fear. I pull on my one piece bathing suit, ride my bike fast and hard away to the beach, lay down on the hot sand next to the beautiful girls on their backs, on their striped towels, tanning themselves into womanhood, their new breasts coming in like delicate blown glass floats adrift from the sea and landing on the creamy skin of the shore, miraculously whole like art, like the glass-infused light cast from the hanging lamps I assemble through my teenage years in the illegal glass studio of my family's naive making. And I will end with a little bit where I began. I had the unbelievable good fortune to have a published a poem published in Poetry Ireland Review in December of 2019, which was the last 
issue that Ivan Boland published. And uh, I cannot tell you how honored I was to hear from her and hear that she had accepted a poem that I really felt was going to speak to her. Um, and I don't have that feeling very often, but I had an intuition and, um, and it worked out and I'm forever grateful. And the poem is about another mentor of mine who had, um, who passed away that I um, had written this in homage to when I found a notebook from many years before with her words that I stitched together with words of my own to create this poem. And I'll let you know, you'll know when it's her voice and my voice. This is called Gratitude Workshop. Um, and I'd like to dedicate it to all of you. And, um, thank you so much to everyone here, Paul and Shauna and everyone there in Cork and, and all of you listening from wherever you are. And uh, to Lawrence, I can't express enough how honored I am to be reading with you, a person of incredible conscience and integrity and artistry. So thank you. This is Gratitude Workshop, notebook number 12, 1991 for Lucy Brock Broido. She said, poetry is about demons and to trust the interior of ice. I ruminate over all the advice we must endure in this world, a precarious stack of dishes at the edge of the sink or a game of midnight freeze tag in a field of no moon. She said, don't apologize, don't explain. If 15 fish swim past. What does the 15th look like? The darkest hour of the recurring bruise. She said, court tension and risk. They don't exchange names. They don't even shake greasy hands. About doubt, it's terminal, more than a blessing. Forgiveness is another night of testimony. How is it you remain unmarried? I told myself it was the mattress. I had a bed, I did not lie. I find fire delectable and can sleep. She said, be careful not to be too good. And so I pretend to fidget with some anger in simplicity, the simple. Let the day bear out its breakdown of horoscopes like coins that disappear into the glass face of a parking meter. All description must be revelation. I can forgive only the first gray hair. And in response to my longing, I burn the toast. Thank you again. Be well, everyone. And we'll see you around Zoom. Andy, thank you so much. That was a really beautiful reading. Thank you so much for your words and your energy. And uh, we'll welcome you to come to Ireland as soon as you can. And uh, I'm sure you'll have many fans here when you do come. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. Please give it up for Sandy and on. And thank, uh, thanks again for such a, a really special reading. Great. Um, so uh, thanks again to Sandy. And next up, I will introduce our next reader. And that is Lawrence McKeown, is an author, playwright, filmmaker and academic, though sees those roles within the broader context of political activism and the role that the arts can play in that. His involvement in creative works, political education and academia began during his period of incarceration as a political prisoner in the H blocks of Long Cash from 1976 to 1992. Following his release from prison, Lawrence completed a doctoral thesis at Queen's University. His thesis was published in 2001, entitled Out of Time. Whilst pursuing his PhD studies, Lawrence co-wrote with Brian Campbell a feature film, H3. Based on the 1981 hunger strike within the prison, which Lawrence participated in for 70 days and during which 10 prisoners died. 
1995, he co-founded the West Belfast Film Festival, which in 2001 expanded citywide to become the Belfast Film Festival. Lawrence has written 12 plays, three books, one TV series, a radio drama, and three documentary films. His most recent play, Green and Blue, by Kabash Theatre, was premiered at the Belfast International Arts Festival in 2016. It has toured Ireland extensively and has been performed in Paris, Dresden, and London. Lawrence was shortlisted for the Irish Writers Guild of Ireland Zebby Award in 2017 for Green and Blue. His debut poetry collection, Threads, was published in 2018 by Salmon Poetry. Lawrence's most recent play, Before You Go, produced by Kabash Theatre, was performed on three occasions over this past week via Zoom. Oh, uh, but, but this past week uh, by being filmed and streamed. Uh, rehearsals were conducted over Zoom and filmed using remote control cameras. Uh, so without further ado, please give a big uh, Zoom round of applause uh, for Lawrence McKeown. Thank you, Shona and uh, Paul and uh, everyone else. It's a pleasure to be to joining you tonight and uh, some amazing um, poetry read earlier there. It's just, I'm always uh, amazed at uh, the fantastic work that people can produce in a very, very short period of time. Um, given the night that's in it, the day that's in it, um, International Women's Day, I'd like to begin with a poem that I wrote <clears throat> in prison. Um, while I was in prison, I studied with the Open University and one of the courses was called uh, The Change in Experience of Women. And the tutor for it was a woman called Joanna McMinn, who later years went on to become the um, CEO of the National Women's Council of Ireland. And uh, we became firm friends. And I'd asked her, would she be prepared to come into the prison and do sort of more informal workshops with us rather than uh, those people who were just enrolled with the Open University because that was a limited number. And uh, she agreed if I would co-facilitate. Uh, co and uh, over the next two years, I think it was about 200 uh, Republican prisoners engaged in the, in the conversations, the workshops. Uh, there were a mixture of difficult conversations, a lot of laughs. Uh, and just a really, really wonderful time. So um, given this is a, the, the day it's in it, um, I'd like to dedicate this poem and uh, many our to all of those women who have formed the threads of my life, um, especially beginning with my mother, who was a very quiet, unassuming woman, but a rock. Uh, my sister and then later, friends, comrades, lovers, and more recently my daughters. So the, the poem is called Feminist. Nicholas Copernicus, Polish astronomer, discovered that we don't inhabit an Earth-centered universe as had been firmly believed before then. At the time, he experienced much difficulty in convincing his contemporaries of the truth of his discovery. Such theories challenged what was natural and God-ordained. And the disciple of Copernicus was the worst of heretics. Four centuries later, we still have our heretics. Now they're known as feminists. Um, this here is a poem that I wrote uh, last year. Um, the National Print Museum of Ireland, along with Creative Ireland, um, had a competition to write uh, a short poem, no more than 12 lines on COVID. And um, I'm glad I, I won it. So this is a given we're still living through a pandemic. Um, this is the poem I wrote last year. It's entitled, uh, I Couldn't Tell Her. After he died, I wrote to his wife about his final hours. Those hours he had spent alone with me. I couldn't tell her it was her he loved, her that he wanted so much to return to, to hold, kiss, make love with. I just couldn't tell her that. I couldn't tell her because he couldn't speak. The stranger to me, I just happened to witness his death. Staff nurse Williams, COVID-19 ward, 13th of April, 2020. 
Um, and I got the inspiration that from uh, a friend, uh, actually the artistic director of Cowboys Theatre, who I work along with, uh, and who's produced most of my plays. And her sister worked was a staff nurse in the ward. And at the very start of COVID last year, when families weren't allowed in uh, to see their loved one in the, in the final stages of their life, the nurses were then asked to write a note to the, uh, to the families of the bereaved. This is uh, the first poem um, that I ever had published. Um, it was written around about 88. And it's interesting, we started poetry workshops in the prison around about 87, 88. And um, I wrote out to Jesse Lantani that I didn't know her at all. Uh, but somehow, uh, Salmon Poetry, um, somebody recommended them or whatever. And I had a bit of a brass neck and just, just wrote to her. And she wrote back and gave us some encouragement and um, good advice. Put me in touch with Radon Higgins, who was just starting out at that time, a fantastic poet. And Radon actually visited me in the jail. And uh, so it's sort of come full circle that uh, years later, uh, when I approached Jesse to see if she'd be interested in publishing some of the poetry, a lot of which was written in the prison and others which were written after it. And thankfully she, um, she, she accepted. Uh, this one's called Hard Lines. Right angles and straight lines, they're everywhere. And I don't like their rigidity. Wall, ceiling, floor, straight, sharp, cold, clinically exact lines meeting in right angles. The window has 20, right angles and straight lines. The door four, yet if we count the spy hole, the grill, 120, I've counted them. Canteen is full of them, tables, shelves, and benches of straight lines and right angles. Well, I want twisted cricket lines, winding, curling, meandering paths, slopes, mounds, hollows, peaks, valleys, dips, curves of land and flesh. And I want them colored. Purples, blues, greens, yellows, bright reds. No more black and white or gray uncertainty. And in different textures too, please, if you don't mind. No more choice of rough or fairy rough. How about fine, soft, furry, fluffy, smooth, velvet, silk? Robotic minds, administrators, bureaucrats created this world of geometric precision. Did they think it beneath themselves to apply their architectural skills to the humble toilet bowl, the only work of prison art and anarchy? Um, one second. This year is the uh, 40th anniversary of the 1981 hunger strike, which Sean is that I took part in. Uh, one of the people who died in that hunger strike was Kieran Doherty, um, or Big Doc, as he was, he was often described because of, of his height. Kieran was first interned without trial uh, as a schoolboy. He was 17 years of age. He was interned for three years. He wasn't the only schoolboy interning. Uh, he was really released and not that long after was rearrested and imprisoned and he never walked free again because he died aged 25 in hunger strike. While he was on his hunger strike he was elected a Chuck to Dollar um, for the constituency of Calvin Monaghan. Um, it didn't save his life the same as it didn't save Bobby Sands life he was elected a member of parliament the Westminster parliament. This is their 40th anniversary. This is called um, Big dog, he was an amazing sort of, he was taller than me, he was about maybe six, three, striking good looks, uh, very well built. Uh, but the really thing about him, he moved almost like a, like a cat, a large cat, like a puma or a cheetah. If anybody else had to try to walk like that, it just sort of looks stupid looking. Uh, but it just, it, uh, it worked for dog, it was like a fluid movement. And it, 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 it added to that sort of, uh, his looks and his build that gave him this fantastic um, the physical presence, uh, so it's called Big Duck. As teenagers new to prison, 
your striking good looks were envied, your physique admired, your confident step, something we could never imitate. In that strange and hostile world, your physical presence gave us security. That you were a little more than a boy yourself, grown to manhood rapidly. A short life as schoolboy and tourney, or an act of service at Oakley and Heron, gave wit to your words, though few words you spoke. Your spell gave encouragement, a nod of your head was enough to prompt compliance. Even those who incarcerated you, admired you, wanted to be like you in their dream world. When I last saw you in the prison hospital in 81, only the shell of your body remained. Your movements slower, though just as definite. Your eyes clear as ever. And your voice soft as before. Confident, assured, steady. Lana Riot. This next poem is also um, has a feminist theme to it. Um, it actually arose in a conversation uh, in, in one of the classes that I, that, that I talked about, and it's how um, images uh, can be, you know, attribute given a gender uh, to what's what, what's feminine and masculine, which is all nonsense, of course. But um, this was called uh, discontented husband. Thug, yes, you. I see through your facade that elegant blouse clings to a breast that holds no heart. Those shapely legs and fashionable culottes power stiletto heels into my brain. Yes, you, thug. Your carefully colored lips smile for others, yet mouth jagged words to me. Painted eyelashes meet in a gesture of disdain. I'm dismissed with a toss of auburn locks, a flick of manicured hand. Thug, tattoo your knuckles, shave your head, wear bovers, chew gum. That way we'll recognize you, avoid you. And by the way, Thug, the dishes still aren't done. Um, I suppose one thing in the, in the North over the years during the conflict was how the media often handled uh, events. And uh, in my view, there might be a certain bias view from my standpoint, uh, portrayed um, state forces in a very different way than, um, than guerrilla ones. And this poem here is called Media Heroes. And it refers to two people, one who was a guy called Brian Nelson. He was a member of a loyalist paramilitary group that was involved in the killing of his human rights lawyer, Pat Finucane, and uh, campaign still going on to this day about the collusion uh, between British security forces and this killing. And uh, the other one was an RUC man, a policeman who walked into Sinn Féin Centre and killed people. It's called Media Heroes. <clears throat> he was a hero, the judge, the media, and his handlers proclaimed, Nelson, not Lord, saved 217 lives, they said. But he killed two innocent tags. That's with a small t. The other, the RUC man, killed three in the Sinn Féin Centre. A hero under stress, they said. Um, this one here is, uh, I suppose at the moment, with work has changed a lot uh, with the, the pandemic. Um, but I've often thought of that thing whenever people refer to as unemployed, sometimes it can be a, the term is used in a very derogatory way. Uh, someone's unemployed except there's something wrong with them that they haven't uh, got gainful employment. Uh, so this is one I wrote when I was outside and unemployed, but I think busy. This is called work. Working? Nah, still on the dole. Doing bits and pieces about the house though. You know, a bit of renovation, put central heating in, new kitchen, new living room, 
new hallway, new bathroom, put new windows in, double glazing. New doors also did all the woodwork and tiling myself, painted and decorated because made a lawn front and back, planted trees, Castle Well and Goals, 28 of them. Converted the attic into a study, published a book, finished my degree, started a thesis by research, wrote a poem and a film script. No, I'm not working, I'm still on the door. Um, this next poem can be can be read as a, an erotic poem. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, it's called Vulnerability. And uh, I was intrigued by the, the difference for me only between being vulnerable to someone or something, as opposed to making yourself vulnerable for someone. And it's just called vulnerability. Fix your eyes upon me, naked, vulnerable to a blow. Circle around me, look for traps. There are none. Interrogate me, question my motives. I will answer truthfully. Cut me, watch blood ooze from armorless flesh. Hit me, see white turn to blue, black, and yellow. When you're sure I pose you no risk, come to me unclothed. Fix your eyes upon vulnerability and protect me. Encircle me with your arms, hug me. Let your eyes question me, mine will reply. With your tongue, pierce my lips, bruise me in passion. Take me into your warmth, feel complete or complimented, but not displaced. Um, a few years ago, I used to uh, visit small town in the north of Italy to do, um, to teach at a, a, a course uh, that went on there. People came from different parts of the world to it. And it's lovely to be a um, town called Robert Atto. And uh, this is just, just a poem about Robert Atto. I had some um, great times and great, great memories and great discussions with, with people from Africa, Palestine, Israel, Ireland, um, Italy and elsewhere. It's Robert Atto. <clears throat> Cold water from the mountain river splashes over the dam and flows under the bridge. Cars intrude upon the cobbled streets, teasing their way like anxious visitors. Graffiti scrawled under archways proclaims an end to fascism. Colorful striped flags demanding peace hang lifeless alongside beautiful window boxes. A couple appear at a balcony on the first floor his arm reaches out to touch the flag and rearrange its folds like a young girl's frock. Her arm encircles his waist from behind and pulls him back indoors. A man cycles past, leaning into the pedals in the steep hill, while his infant male passenger sprawls in his carrier. Old women dressed in black carry fresh bread rolls home for breakfast. The town is lazy in the early morning. Its inhabitants respect silence. Um, I think my time is, is nearly up, so uh, I'll just do this other short one here. Um, some of you may recall uh, three Irish people who ended up in uh, Colombia some years ago, became known as the Columbia Three, um, accused of working with the uh, FARC guerrilla movement there. And um, I appeared at their trial, I visited Bogota on three different occasions um, to, give, to give evidence. It's just called Bogota, Colombia. Buttered cars and trucks, too many or too close. Vibrate the hotel walls in downtown Bogota. Between cotton sheets, I lie awake in plush accommodation. Body clock at home in Ireland at the breakfast table. Hotel sounds are much the same the world over. Like prison sounds, they echo the lives of captured humanity. That's it. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Lawrence. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I really want to get your poem work on a t-shirt. So uh, I have something to say when people ask yeah. me what I've been doing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, everybody, please give it up again for Lawrence McKeown. And thank you very much. And thanks again uh, to Sandy and Nunn. Uh, give it up for them for their wonderful reading. And uh, we've had a great night so far. And the night continues. Uh, up next, we have the open mic. Uh, so you, if you would like to read a poem or a short piece of reading, uh, open mic enthusiasts are now asked to sign up by typing open mic plus your name into the chat box here and uh, you can read uh, it's three minutes max per reader uh, so just one one piece of writing please and uh, if you go a little bit over it it's fine it's not, it doesn't have to be exactly three minutes but just uh, uh, just stick to the one please and let me see yeah I think that's it so oh great we have some names here uh, so first up is uh, just before we do that again, I'd just like to thank our guest readers again. Um, it's really great to hear both of your work. And I'm excited to hear the, the open mic participants. So we will begin with Melissa, please. Melissa? Hi. Hi. How are you? Hi, everyone. Um, okay. I'm going to read this poem. Crocosmia flowers. How did we get here? He asked. The palm of the hand, Crocosmia flowers. The licks of fire scorching between the hands, on the cheeks, in the mouth. Broad and slender bowel. A O U E E. Do not run out of air, she said. Breathe as if all air was yours, as if it wasn't meant to peter out. What does it taste like? I don't know, he said. My cheeks are burning. If I had to purchase bottled air, According to its quantity, he sighed. A flock of birds was on fire, scratching the sun on its way yonder. The flapping of the wings hastened the baldness. Those are vain attempts consumed. Now they fall down like stones and the fields burn. Shh, she said. Do not feel sorry yet. We are inhaling the same. We don't know where the air comes from, where it goes afterwards, who else is breathing, under what name. I place the tip of my tongue against the palate, but the word never comes out as it should be, as the original. I believe this word to be impossible. I should learn to give up. No, he said. There's no way to say no or to say yes. In this tongue, the truth is reached through the periphrasis. Everything is said in order not to say either yes or no. We never got this journey started, she said. It is a journey with no beginning. We came across each other in between sooner or later. It's the years. And we, all, and we are almost breathless. But what does it taste like? Crocosmia flowers, he lied. That was his first thought, for his hands were burning. He made a bouquet, and another, and another. But the flames did not stop dancing. This variety is known as Emily Mackenzie. They look angry or stunned, she said. He smiled. He had beautiful teeth. I wanted to give you a bouquet, but there are too many, and it doesn't make sense anymore. They looked at each other in another language like the air. They were inside a circle of all those crocosmia flowers that were growing 
Non-Stop from the Hands, Derek, Flan Bui, Bui, he said, silence. And again, the stones coming down with the sound of a glare. The black bones sprouted up from the birds over the field, the moor dense on the charred land far away. It got cold. Those flowers wither and fade, she said. Blacks and grays, just like the night is poured out on us. Your hands are hot, they hurt steel. The impossible word makes you blush. Me too. I can't say it. Don't say yes or no. As if all air was yours, breathe. Thanks. Thank you, Melissa. Um, next up is Colin Scully. Um, yeah, uh, uh, thanks, um, Shauna. On International Women's Day, this is a, a villanelle I wrote for my aunt who died about seven years ago. It's called Auntie. Washing duck eggs at the kitchen sink, placing in their trays the blue and green and white ones. That is how I think of you. You're giving me a drink of orange with a plate of custard creams, washing duck eggs at the kitchen sink. Gathering up the trays you're going to bring to the English market, feather clean. I wonder if that would be to think of you. I stretch my arms out, help you carry the trays out to your sky blue Ford Capri, washing duck eggs at the kitchen sink. Nephews, nieces at the graveside bring varying memories of that scene. I was special to her, each one thinks. Eleven of us passing on our way, popping in our heads throughout the day, chatting with us, asking her things, washing duck eggs at the kitchen sink. Thank you so much, Colm. Thanks a million. Um, sorry, I actually skipped ahead some names there. I didn't realise uh, a few people had gotten in. Uh, before that so I'll just go back to the the names that I missed and um, but thanks a million for that column and um, so Damien B Donnelly Hi thanks very much uh, congratulations Lawrence and Sandy that was just astounding um, I've got two short poems to keep it in the three minutes and um, for International Women's Day and um, the first one was in Fevers of the Mind Press from last year um, and it's dedicated to memory of my former boyfriend who now has found wings as a woman. In the kitchen, breaking noise before dawn, you grind grains into something more sippable, stilled under the shadow of something unsettling. I shift position too naturally while still snoozing, Setting my sleeping skin into the soft spot your body has since shed. As your tongue lets the caramel of coffee tingle across taste buds slowly changing. In that kitchen, swallowing simple warm things in the morning before the day comes to choke us. And the second little poem is from the title collection of my debut pamphlet, Eat the Storms, um, and it's called Scarlet Rising. Eat the storms, mother said. Boil those beds of bitter blackness until the dream rips through the rain and translucent turns to trust. Even a diamond must ache in the darkness until compression can no longer conceal. Eat the storms, mother said. Slip out of shivering skin until touch recalls the sweet music of scarlet rising. Caught below the lick of leaf, lost in the shadow of the shade. Even the petal must rise above the thorn before it can dance in the light. Eat the storms, mother said, but I didn't hear it at first. It takes time to swallow the truth and teach the tongue to taste the rain. 
Thank you very much for a fantastic evening. Well, thank you so much, Jamie. That was great. Um, super. Uh, so next up, we have Pam Campbell, please. This is an epistolary poem and I'm in a partnership with a friend who we're writing to each other. So my poem's in response to her poem to me. It's called Open Door. You remember me writing you about the open doors, the one Sister Mary Margaret spoke with me about at the mother house? Well, friend, when I opened your letter and saw that we recalled the very same moment in our first meeting, I thought, this is an open door. One that I caught a glimmer of that day in the kitchen of the mother house. Sometimes we cross thresholds without knowing not meaning to take breath of space from another, hoping that there is air enough for difference, for connection. That day when I said I was homeless, your eyes shadowed, your muscles tensed. The room lost its warmth. I slipped back across the threshold just as the door whispered shut. I feared judgment in the silence and wished I could draw the word back from that brief shared space. Yet I learned in your recent letter that you cast no stones. The two steps back you took was for air you perceived to be calmer and safer, albeit reckoning it an empty trade, the currency for security. I am no stranger, excuse me, I am no stranger to hopeful building on branches too frail to hold. We are the women woven in wrong tradition, a quiet desperation like birds on a wire strung too tight, too charged. You call yourself a slow learner, oh gentle friend. You were a quick learner of lessons taught to women. We are not figured equal in the equation the world dictates, putting aside self for family and others, giving, not receiving. Even in the best of circumstances, are we not primed to run dry? And in the worst, to thirst for home and haven and burrow in sunless caves. You say your heartstrings that tethered you to this ground have been severed and you don't know where to go. Blessed unknowing, here is where your right to self governing begins on your ground, not another's, not even common ground yet. For how can we create common ground without nourishing? and rooting ourselves. Self-governing requires knowledge. Knowledge requires expansion. Expansion requires breath. I learned to breathe into dark ache, deep in the bone of me, the hollow of my emptiness. Breath that bent, but did not break me. Breath by breath drew me into the blade of sadness and anger, sharpened and defined me, grounded me. Dear friend, is where you start. Super, thank you so much, Pam. Thanks for sharing that. Um, just one thing as well, if you do have short poems, uh, you can read more than one as long as it's uh, within the three minutes time frame ish uh, Just wanted to add that there. Uh, so thanks again, Pam. Uh, next up is Anne MacDonald. Thanks very much, Sean, and um, big thank you to Sandy and to Lawrence. It's my first time hearing you read, Lawrence, um, so it's a real privilege. I'm just going to read one short poem, and it's part of a series of what I call Belfast poems. And um, I really had Sandy to thank for these poems because I had written them a good few years ago, and I'd almost wasn't going to include them in my book. I know I'm peddling this book, but this is my debut collection. I'm very excited. Um, to, it's finally come to fruition. We launched on the 18th of March. But I, I wasn't going to include these poems. And then Sandy um, offered me a, a slot on Cultivating Voices. And I read some of them. And the reaction was, was really heartwarming. So it made me revisit them. And this one in particular, very short poem, is a tribute to one of my heroines, which was my Auntie Bridie. Uh, she was a phenomenal woman. And I grew up in Betty Stand, and I'm, I'm back here now. But my father was a very prissy man. He had what we call notions. 
and he was the bank porter of the Allied Irish Bank in West Street in Drogheda. He thought he was the manager, but he actually was the porter. But he came home one day from work absolutely mortified. And uh, he, he was really not impressed because when he told us what happened, of course, we cracked up laughing, which didn't help. But this poem is a tribute on International Women's Day to my Auntie Bridie. And it's called H Block March, Drogheda, 1981. And it's a true story. Standing in the doorway of the bank, porter, friend, affectionately respected my father, chatting to the manager in West Street. They left Belfast the day before, arriving now in growing numbers, carrying handmade coffins clad in black, accompanied by the local kids and usual hecklers. Share of hooligans, said the father. Blocking the traffic, said the manager. She would have waved, but her left hand carried her homemade flag and her right her shopping basket with floral umbrella in case of rain. So my auntie Bridie shouted instead, how are you aiming? Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. Thanks a million and congratulations on your book. It's very exciting. Um, great stuff. Uh, so next up is Margaret O'Regan, please. Thanks, Shauna. Um, today is the marks 333 days for Debenhams workers to be on strike. Um, so I'm going to read again um, my poem called The Devil Wears Debenhams, and it's an acrostic poem. So that's also reading down the left. These Debenhams workers have paved the way every minute of every day. Dignified women and men are they, evil devils in Debenhams they face. Villainous vultures in boardroom culture imagine they can with their despicable plan lord it over the workers they slammed. But workers thrown on the scrap heap erupt and fight back, everyone so determined in this first COVID strike. A win for these workers is a win for us all, refusing to kowtow, not taking a fall, staying the course in all 11 stores. Debenhams directors, contemptible, covetous cretins, each and every one a grasping, avaricious louse. By, st st by standing up together, Wherever they gather, every one of these workers will go hell for leather. Non-ending solidarity at home and far afield has enveloped these brave fighters in a force field and revealed a strength and revelation so supremely divine, making them the spearhead of revolt during COVID, standing firm and steadfast in face of corporate greed. And one other thing about them as well, while I was on the picket line in Cork City this morning, um, they got a message from UFCW Local 400 members in Virginia, US, sending their solidarity and support. Imagine, it has gone truly international. Great stuff. Thanks, Millian Margaret. And uh, thanks for all the work you do. Um, great. Uh, next up, oh, it's Michelle Delay. Hi, guys. Happy Women's Day. It's good to be a woman. Um, this is called Double Room to Rent in Cork. In the photo of the bed at the awkward angle, with the lamp click down in the corner in the middle of the day, there's a poster of the world on the wall, the one with the golden countries you scratch off tiny and tediously with a palette knife, coin or key. North America appears totally conquered, Southeast Asia too. There may be still some peels of them on the carpet below the border of the map. Though it's been hoovered for this photo even the windows have been opened. 
The lemon and pine of it all are dulled by the grey of the weather. The tenant in the door frame, wishing to push the walls apart. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's beautiful. Um, next up is Augustina, maybe. Hi. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Yes. Brilliant. Okay. This one is called My Nose is Buried in Love. And it's basically because <laughs> I found that when I love someone, I love everything about them, including their smells. Um, every single one of the smells, even the nasty ones. Okay, so here we are. I like the smell of his morning breath passing through his nose. I like the smell of his neck when he wakes up in the morning. I like the smell of his armpits after he's been riding on his bike or gone for a walk. I like the smell of his feet when he takes his shoes off. He says I remind him of a goat. Well, ba ba ba. Goats sniff around when they want to mate. Apparently he tended to the goats once at some point. He's patient and, I let, and he lets me sniff him until I've had enough, even when it looks awkward and rough. But I don't think this level of sniffing is normal. Casually inhaling his essence like Coke. Anyway, I don't want to just uh, poke or bang. I enjoy the feeling of comfort and safety that all of his smells give me. Does this qualify as a love poem? I don't know for sure, but loving you is easy. Like breathing, once you fill my lungs with your presence, suffocate me with your stench. You make me so high and leave me craving. Is this why people make babies? Babies have a similar effect, or is it just me ovulating and definitely needing to get a grip? Funny, all's grip too. Good grief, my nose is truly buried in love. Thank you so much, Augustina. Great. Um, next up, we have Ada Miles. I don't Thanks. Uh, okay, I'll do this one. It's about learning language, in my case, German. And it's a bilingual poem, but I hope that all the lines in German are just understandable from the context of everything else. Uh, learning German. Zwei languages verliebt, two of them in law. I find it amazing. I never stroll. Here comes the zone. Here comes the sun. How, ca how hard can it be? The journey begun. It just came to me. They connect so well. A tear is an animal. What the hell? No mind to cry now. Ist mir halt recht. It's all perfect with me. I mean it. Echt. A gift is a poison. Something in that. Brought you some hot brown bread. Ear is you. Plural. Fun to the ear. By the same token, no, Hern is here. My brain does the pigeon, so my tongues are flipped. Amusing to see how fast they have gripped. That's it, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, next up we have Karen Warinsky. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm so happy to be reading here with everybody for the first time. And I'll be under three minutes, but I do have two pieces. And they were both inspired by the most recent full moons. And so the first one is called The Edge of the Season. We've almost had enough of this cold, this bleak, this drear. Coyotes howled behind my house two nights ago, the moon their maven. But when I opened the window and howled back, they didn't reply. They are on the edge. But today, the sun is out flashing its light on all the wonders of winter, minuscule crystals turning aqua, violet, orange, reflecting its cheerful glow. And the air feels fresh and new, like a clean sheet of paper, where we will write our year, a conduit for the coyote's call. Thank you. And this also was inspired by the February full moon. The first one was January. And um, also an article I read in the Atlantic uh, magazine and it's called Metal Harvest. The lost balloon of a moon slides along behind a smear of clouds bright in the winter sky. It is 5 p.m. and pushing towards spring. 
people trying to feel hope in the frosty twilight, a snow moon, reconciliation and recovery in its fullness, a beaming silent promise. Did Joan lean on her sword, pray her cause would be blessed underneath its quiet glow? Did soldiers in the Argonne pray it would disappear and help them survive another night? Iron is reaped from the ground each year by the farmers near Verdun, barbed wire and bullets, the leavings of war, and unexploded bombs dropped during those 47 days of death emerge like iron rocks in the untilled soil. More than 100 years have passed. They say it may take 100 more before this metal harvest is through. Meanwhile, on the old trenches and in the everlasting forest, Earth's gashes grow green while sheep graze and sometimes go home in Luna's light. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. That's great. Uh, thanks a million. Next up is Daniel Johnson. Hi guys, can you hear me all right? Great, awesome. Um, this poem is called uh, Three Days in the County Mail. We had porridge and honey for breakfast and the sun rose over the fields of the county mail. You drove your blue Peugeot through the arteries of Connemara. I held one hand out the window, surfing the air, the other in your hair. The northwestern fields salt silage slurry, the scent of the air freshener, the shape of the Virgin Mary, your breath when we kissed at stop signs. We stayed the night in an old woman's B&B. &B. She greeted us in Irish. We made love in the rickety double, just the other side of the wall from her. We had porridge and honey for breakfast and the sun rose over the fields of the county mail. While you drove, I admired the bog rose flying banners in the ditches. In Westport, we moseyed through the streets to the sea until you grew quiet. You saw dolphins somewhere beyond, green octopi winking off the coast, and you only told me afterwards, as soon as they departed. That night, we slept together between two round bales in a currogate barn, the animals looking on with sullen eyes. What must they have assumed? We never made it to Ackle or Sheer Milray, never gazed upon the Moy, because I woke up in a flat in Cork City, tired, never having left. In bed alone, it all seemed silly your Peugeot, my hand, the Blessed Mother, the clattering bed frame, the heartbreaking hamlets of Connacht, because I've never sniffed north of Galway, and you busted your car on a flower pot in Manor West. I haven't seen you in months. But this morning, I had porridge and honey for breakfast, and still the sun rose over the field of the county mail. Cheers. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Dan. And next up is oh, Kiran. Okay. Thanks, Lashana. Um, happy International Women's Day to you all. Um, yes, yeah, so this is a new poem. <clears throat> Sitting coy and sipping snaps, where's the talk of chatter at? Waiting for an elbow tack, he's jingled to announce the fact a quarter ounce or so of bag has dropped its tag, a stressed asset gone forth to become a valued commodity with traffic heading north. Was hoping for some prodigy to come up to me at source when up you came to talk to me to see how run the course. Well, waltzing round the room, equal parts gesture and voice would have done the same again if given the choice. 
cans to consume and tunes to make the speakers make noise, thread on the loom, everyone their dog and their toys. Best to assume that you might be on with some boy, wouldn't rush to presume any sort of loyalty from joy. There are jokes crying out for punchlines and it's become a brawl. Best act on your hunch, sunshine. Get on the floor and crawl. Sidle up next to the fiend with the phone in his hand and foresee some drops to make the free-falling land. Splash around the room pretending to be water. Run a four-minute mile at a canter. Roll the inside of your hips, chase your smile to every corner. Look squarely at the digits to keep your house in order. Wet your mouth and find the couch, pour pockets for dry paper. Oh, hey, there, it's you. What are you doing later? Thank you. Thanks, Kieran. Um, next up is... Um... Catherine Ronan. I am, um, I, the poem I'm going to read now is published in a, an anthology called Wexford Women Writing Undercover. Uh, the title is misleading really because it's an international anthology. So I'm very happy to be part of that. Um, now this poem is dedicated to female prisoners of anything everywhere. And it's called Escape. I see the black and white struggle for color. Seven years old, brave hunter, now it hunts you. Morning orange, barbed wire, sings everywhere. With a smile, you will make it. The only bird you could ever draw was you, fly. I will whisper in your ear every day. I will sleep in your pocket every night until you hear me until you feel a thousand kisses, until you stand up free. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks. Um, next up is um, Sue Blue. Decision time, so, um, uh, right. Um, I'll do a poem that some of you might heard, might have heard before, but it, I'm doing it in honor of uh, the day that's in it uh, and uh, the season that has begun. This is Biology Drive. Oh, I love the luscious spree of the springtime ovulation. When life is waking up and she calls for procreation. How red our lips and tips stand to attention like raspberries. With excitement and attention that is begging for release. She demands me to bow to biology, to biology drive. I get dressed in finest laces, shape the outfit and my face is set to go out on the hunt seeking vernal stimulation. Because my flesh is under spell with a wolfish sensual notion with a touch from skin to skin and the urge for satisfaction. I surrender to the power of biology drive. What my mind is set to find for this burning ovulation is the finest suiting male to release my tantric ocean. With a wolfish deep desire, juices flowing set on fire. When a touch of hot skin makes me melt to the seduction, then I bow to the power of biology drive. And we know what happens now, that's in your imagination. So I close the curtains down in respect and admiration for the magic time of spring, so particularly strong. In the years within my rhythm, I have come to the conclusion that this springtime ovulation is a trick by evolution. And I bow to the power of biology drive. Thanks very much. Thanks, Lillian Sue. Uh, next up is Susanna. Thank you. 
Okay, so I wrote a long poem for uh, the survivors of the Magdalen Laundry. And in particular, um, this poem is uh, dedicated to my friend Mary, her mom and her auntie, who are both survivors of the Mothers and Babies Home. The Heart Song. August in the scent of brown barley, pinches my nose close to my eyes. I find you. Your nose under your brother's hat, no hair on your light framed torso. Why do men have nipples? Yours look absolutely ridiculous. My legs, they can raise you to the cliff and back. I'm the fastest. I shine more than the sun. In fact, I am the sun. You breathe on the corrugations of my skin, salted hair, hands afraid to touch, rich red curls rub against, feet gripping in the moss. Only the pheasants can hear us. Tree. The river Lee is moaning. Nora is gone from the sad to the mad, the river Lee whispered. She lost her chords, singing at the umbilical chords propped up under her pillow. She dropped her heart in soaps for the rich. She rubbed clean sheets so hard that her hands broke and the blood flooded the laundry, making it all red. Even the bricks. The river Lee cried. She was sitting next to her daughter one day, thinking of her, not knowing she was hers. Incredible how baby hands can be so perfect. Gone from the sad to the mad and back, the river Lee said. Four, at a protest in Grand Parade. This is not my story to tell, the pretty mother said. The hunger was eating the stomachs in Vesperu. Nora pulled the bread wet of dog saliva out of the dog's teeth. She swallowed it without chewing so that the buds wouldn't taste. Then Father Brendan was at the altar, throwing holy water on the white light apron of Eleanor's best years, on her broad and soft hips. She's churched, he said while eating blessed fresh bread with bitter sermons. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susanna. Um, thanks for sharing. Uh, next up in the open mic, we have, sorry, I'm after getting uh, caught up in the, the comments. I can't find who's next. Sorry. Just a moment. No worries. OK, uh, sorry. Uh, so next up is Paul Talent, please. All right. Uh, yeah, I've got a little thing here. I've just found um, I plan to read something tonight, but I'm between houses at the moment. And um, all my stuff's in storage, including me writing. So uh, I've got this from a little script I wrote about uh, a couple of homeless fellas. Um, I'm fed up, fed up of being anxious, not more than the blankness of a canvas. I'm ridiculous, nebulous, frivolous, defin definitions given to me by the omnipotent. Just because I don't have a job and I don't pay tax, I've less worth than a candy crush app. Please don't ask me for money, I'll just look the other way. Get a job, you crackhead, or some instrument you can play. Isn't that exactly what they say? My heart beats, my sweat will pour. I have dreams and ambitions that I have to ignore. Parents who aren't there anymore. I feel happy and sad, even horny too. For God's sake, I'm just like you. We follow Darwin, but something is amiss. Why should I have to justify my right to exist? If you want to be animals, stop pretending to be human. Sit with me here, let's watch the movement. Monkeys in suits with snakes' eyes, fueled by egos and desperate lies, never actually questioning why, and yet it's me that you all despise. Based on the stats by the so-called wise, the prophets of your gods, those almighty sods, in the news of the world and in the sun and in the Daily Mail, they are not men, they are only prophets. Their only prophets are the ones in the pockets. I love this place, the people, the city. You fund my life through your tax and your pity. 
But what I really want is a voice that is heard. Take my advice, just take in every word. Go back to school or do anything just to remind yourself that there's more to life than just earning and a living. Nice one. Thanks a million, Paul. This one. Uh, great stuff. So uh, next up is uh, me trying to, <laughs> to find who's next. Sorry, I'll just. Um, uh, Uh, great. Uh, thanks a million. Uh, so next up is Paul Rabinowitz. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. I just plugged in a mic, so I wasn't sure. So thank you. Um, I kind of missed you last month, so I'm glad to be back in Cork in mind. I'm from New Jersey here. And my first poem, two very short poems, but my first poem is dedicated to a poet who passed away last week. Her name is Denise Bell. She's from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, she was a true champion of the homeless and wrote most of her poems about um, the homeless population in Brooklyn. So this is for her. It's called Rose. This morning outside my window, orange and red light linger on the edge of a cloud, yellow turns gold. Set upon the desk where I write these poems for you, a rose opens wider than I've ever seen before. Maybe God exists or just a muse tapping. Have faith, it says, choose a common noun for the title of the collection. One syllable is all you'll need. Then stand by it, be ready to defend as the meaning will change and transform over time. So that was for Denise. She was a really beautiful soul, but her spirit lives on in her poems. Thank you. And this is for Women's Day. This is for all the women who have inspired women and for all the women who inspired men and for all the women who have inspired all those others that we love. And this is called Dolly. And it's all about Salvador Dolly's muse, Gala, who, if it wasn't for her, there would be no Dolly. I had the most interesting dream last night about a woman who dressed like Salvador Dolly and a man who dressed like his muse, Gala. Each impression of the other fell for the impression of the other, but when their true selves were revealed, the man who dressed as Gala decided to borrow the clothes from the woman who dressed as Salvador Dali. The woman was so moved, she dressed in the clothes of his muse, Gala, and together they decided to photograph each other with an old camera that had no film, yet the idea of the photo that never came to be became the idea for a novel that was never written, but remained locked in his mind as he removed his tie and carefully set it on the wax end of her elegant mustache. Thank you. <laughs> Happy Woman's Day. Thank you so much, Paul. Thanks for sharing that great stuff. Um, okay, uh, finally, our last reader uh, as of now, for the evening, is Cahal Holden. Hey guys. Oh, I see. I've um, I've made a hames of things. Technology. Am I right? <laughs> that's close. And... Jesus, that's useless. Sorry, guys. Um, one second. So I'm going to dig out a really old piece, actually. Um, yeah, this is one I wrote a long, long time ago, oh, 2012, I think. It's called The Beggar Man. Atop the hill, the dotted distance, I alight and find the body of a beggar man that that acquiesces into dust. I dig his grave and drag his hearse so he may disperse his life into an apple tree. 
It works its roots into his shroud and grows its roots up to the clouds. It is more tasteful than chips of green glass or a statue of an angel. In his pocket, I find the nub of a pencil and the blueprints to what might be a masterpiece, the till roll of a lifetime. I will take them with me when I leave him and I will honor them, pay the bearer upon receipt the sum of simplicity, for he is now at rest. I leave myself there to vanish into myself like water into sand, and I fly at the speed of thought, my deeds wrought and end sought to a battle fought in which, in which both sides surrendered, each unto the other within themselves. I flow to where I know a fault line grows, an outstretched hand towards a cavern where a river shows its colours to the walls. I feel closer here at the heart of things. I will always come back. I walk to the crack and sit at its base. I know this place and it knows me. I am tempted to leave myself here too, but I know if I place my heart in the fissure, it would break under pressure. So at length I leave the river and my heart in its cage to sing its ease and grow. So one day it may find the strength to be released. I have nothing but complexity to add to your simplicity. And I wonder, could I ever elicit the felicity you seek? I am not weak. I have seen how strong I can be and I'm working towards it. I have a way to go a distance yet to travel. Thank you. Cheers, thanks a million, Cahill. Uh, great stuff. Uh, sorry, I actually missed a name uh, in the list. Uh, my sincere apologies, um, but uh, last, but uh, very not least, uh, is the wonderful Meg Creedon. So, Meg. Okay, thanks, Donna. I'm going to try singing a song that I did with them, with our group, with the Five Word Challenge, and um, the words were sleep, regime, IUD, energy, aura. And uh, we, I just did a little poem there. I found this kind of a grieving goblet in it. And uh, I did it as uh, that week as well. I just stuck um, the words of the poem and the lyrics of a, a tribute to um, an artist, because our songwriters group just do a tribute to an artist, and the artist said Joseph Django. Well, give me a bit of rope here now, please. <laughs> I need a new sleep regime. It won't involve over Tina Raspberry Jen. I'll order up some moral messaging for you. Must whisper me your sweet nothings. I, I, you do demand some tea and sympathy. I desire some of your empathy. You have sapped all my precious energy. So give me back my mojo, honey. Give and take, soft hearts must break. They get molded and remelded. Give me time, admit of fines. They'll be pardoned when they're scolded. Sharia moor, do not do moor, indulge me just a little. Give me sugar, my pleasure, the moor, and go careful, cause I'm brittle. Coming soon, an aging honeymoon, presumed to outlast lust. And we will have a great comeback, a new franchise, just us. I need a new sleep regime to remodel and start again, to refresh the settings for a brand new screen. 
just whisper me your sweet nothings. Give and take, soft hearts won't break. They're just melted and remolded. Give me time, admit love crimes. They'll be pardoned in their scolding. Do -do 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 I need a new sleep regime. They won't all from Raspberry Jam. I'll order up some moral messaging to get me up your best to leave. I'll order up some moral messaging for you. Must whisper me your sweet nothing. That's it. And there's my daughter reading in the middle of the show. I thought it was on silent. Thanks a million, Mags, and congratulations again for being our five word winner for the evening. Thanks a million. Uh, thanks a million. And thank you so much to everybody who shared uh, their work on the open mic tonight. It's great to hear so many voices. And uh, one good thing about this is that we get to connect with people uh, from different parts of the world that maybe normally we wouldn't have the opportunity to. So thank you so much for all of your contributions. And I'd like to give it up once again for our guest readers, uh, Sandy Yanon and Lawrence McKeown for their wonderful readings and for being with us here this evening. Um, so that's it for the... 656th yeah uh Oval event uh for now we will go on to uh you can stay around normally if this was irl uh we'd go to the pub nearby call arthur means uh but since that's not possible now we can have a virtual uh arthur means if anybody wants to stay on uh we can uh, chat for a while and if not then uh, Ovale will be back next month and it's the anniversary event so you can bring along poems of somebody that you like to read at the open mic uh, so thank you so much to everybody Bye. again Bye. for the five words and the open mic and everybody watching on Facebook um, that's all folks <laughs> thanks thanks a million